Uh, so this is the Panky Institute. For those of you who have uh, been there before, you recognize this slide and you're wishing you were down in South Florida, except I understand there's a horrible thunderstorm right now. So uh, maybe you don't want to be there. Uh, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm coming to you live from my basement, aka the webinar studio. And um, we have had beautiful weather today. It was sunny and clear skies and 69 degrees, light breeze. It was fabulous. Top was down in the Jeep all day. Okay. So um, real quick, I think we, you hear a lot of talk about um, everybody loves to quote Simon Sinek on, on um, start with why. This is my why. Uh, my family is why I do everything that I do. It's my wife and my two children, Allie and Addison. Uh, this was them when they were younger. And uh, you can see the personalities coming through. And this is what happens. They, uh, they grow up. They grow up and we grow out, I think, is what happens. Um, anyway, as their hair grew longer, mine disappeared. And uh, the, uh, the, the next thing that happens is they get even older and then they, they turn into these little hippies. And uh, my youngest, Addison, is taller than my mother by a whole head and has been that way for a couple of years now. Now, for those of you that know my mother, she's four foot 11 and three quarters. So that's not saying much, but anyway. Uh, so that's, that's my family and that's, that's, my, that's my why. Everything I do is for them. Um, this is our, our logo for the office. Uh, as I said, I am in private practice. Uh, it's a fee for service practice. We're not contracted with any insurance companies. And um, that makes a difference in some regards for us because the relationship then is between myself and the patient. We inform the patient of the conditions, the patient informs us of what their desires are, what their hopes are, what they want for their mouth, for their smile, for their teeth. And then we um, can present to them what we think is, you know, the options to, to achieve their goals uh, without a third party getting in the way. Now, half my patients do have dental insurance, I can tell you that. And they utilize that benefit. Remember, it's not really insurance. They get a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars a year towards their dental care. That's great. It's wonderful, but it doesn't dictate our treatment and, and that frees us up a little bit. Uh, so just a little bit about that. Uh, some disclosures. I, I don't have any financial or personal interest in any products or companies that I might mention here tonight. I'm going to try not to mention any of them, but that sometimes happens because it's just what we use and what we do. Um, I, uh, so I don't get paid by anybody other than my patients. Um, and my dentist, I pay for my lab bills and nothing is free. Um, uh, I am a key opinion leader for iTero and I do some presenting for them. And recently, uh, Brassler has uh, asked my opinion on some new product stuff, but I don't even get free Brassler stuff. So uh, anyway, there's no, no conflicts there. I am on the visiting faculty at the Panky Institute and uh, I presently teach in the uh, Essentials 3 course. I've taught in all of them, and uh, that's where I'm needed the most right now. I'm also a adjunct clinical faculty at the Dental College of Georgia at Augusta University, formerly GRU, GHSU, MCG, whatever. It's the dental school in Georgia. They change the name on it every couple of years. Um, and none of my images have been uh, um, altered. Uh, there's no Photoshopping or anything, only maybe cropping if there was extraneous stuff on the outside. Okay, so let's start with a case. I, I find the easiest way for dentists to start talking about anything is to start showing teeth. I could get into a lot of esoteric stuff first, but show teeth and you win. This is um, a young lady who came to me several years ago. She was 18 and um, had a, a um, alcohol-related incident. She was in college and she uh, face-planted the, the uh, curb and broke some teeth. Uh, she was not really in any pain at this point. So she was at school at Auburn University in Alabama and she um, saw the, she went to the emergency room and they stitched her lip up rather poorly, I think. And, um, but didn't do anything to her teeth. They just stitched her lip. I think they took x-rays to make sure her face wasn't broken. And um, that was it. And she, you know, then came to see me. So by the time I see her, the lip is healed. Uh, her teeth are sore, sensitive and painful. Uh, some of them have some mobility, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and of course, she's unhappy with the look. This is all pre-COVID, so she wasn't wearing a mask 
to, uh, to, to block this out. Uh, so let's look closer at her. And what you'll notice is number eight, upper right central, she had fractured uh, maybe a, a, a third of the tooth off, let's call it, and, uh, but sheared the facial enamel right off. So she's had a, 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 a horizontal fracture and a shearing fracture of the enamel. There are multiple fracture lines in her teeth uh, and, um, and that tooth is very sensitive. Uh, tooth number seven, the upper right lateral, is very mobile. It's discolored at this point and is quite painful if you touch it. Um, she also fractured uh, the upper left, uh, both bicuspids, 12 and 13. She sheared off the entire buccal side of, of both teeth in this fall, which is pretty amazing. So here you can see that, that number seven and number eight. And this is the x-ray of number seven. So this is where I start going, well, what do we do? It's not just a cosmetic fix anymore, is it? Um, so we, we know we've got to manage what is a, a fractured number seven. And it's fractured really at the crest of bone or maybe even apical to the crest of bone. The only thing holding the crown of her tooth in her head is just the, the, the connective tissue fibers of the, of the soft tissue. Uh, the, the, that, that tooth was flapping in the breeze. It was super loose. And um, as I said, painful. So at first glance, you know, my thought was, well, you're going to lose this tooth. Um, there's not enough tooth to, um, to restore. There's no, we would have no feral effect. Uh, but I said, you know, I'm, I, I work with a group of specialists and let's see if we can together come up with the best, the best ideas, the best possible options for you. Remember, she's 18, by the way. Uh, so here's what I'd like to do. In the chat, if, if people would mind go into the chat and just throw out ideas. How are you gonna manage? And I'm just talking about number seven right now. How do you wanna manage this tooth? Um, so this is the participation part of the course. If you don't participate, we, we take points off. I'm kidding. Extract and implant. Uh, ex, uh, endo and ortho extrude, excellent. Perio consult, ortho extrusion. Root canal ortho extrusion, ortho extrusion and endo, extracting a super erupted endo. Have you guys already seen this lecture? Keep root tip with endo. So yeah, it's exactly where my head was. I looked at the root and I said, wait a minute, this is a really long and very broad root for a lateral. So root canal and crown lengthening. So Julie, Let's talk about root canal and crown length for a minute, but let me finish that comment. So here's the idea. Uh, some roots are very tapered and short. And if you have a really tapered root, that's like an ice cream cone and it's really short, if you orthodontically extrude it, you are not gonna have an excellent root left, okay? Julie's idea of root canal and crown lengthening, here's my concern with that. Let's go back to her smile. If we crown lengthen to get enough tooth exposed to be able to have a, a ferrule that we could uh, you know, predictably attach a crown to, that gingival margin is now going to be probably five or six millimeters apical to the gingival margin on the adjacent teeth. That is, that is not going to be an aesthetic look at all. Uh, so uh, somebody else said a perio consult. So I think the point of that though is this. Yes, you're right. We need some consults. However, what I have found with most of the people that I've worked with is they tell me that the common referral comes from the doctor. They get this patient, they get a referral note that says, um, please do a perio consult or please evaluate fractured number seven. Um, and there's not a lot of detail there. And, and by the way, and, and, and I don't want to knock anything anyone's doing. I'm just going to tell you what I do. When we refer a patient like this, two things are going to happen. Number one, I'm going to have an actual conversation with the doctor before they ever see the patient. And we're going to discuss 
what I'm thinking. And maybe together we're going to come up with an idea I hadn't even thought of. But also, you know, y'all get the little tear off uh, referral slips from your specialist, right? And, um, and, and we tear those off and you can write on those and you might write a really nice detailed note and then we give it to the patient. Uh, but then the patient's responsible for bringing it. And the first time that the, the, the referring doctor sees it, uh, the specialist sees it, uh, is the day the patient walks in. So what we do is we give them the tear off. I don't even write anything on it. I just give it to them because it has the information for that doctor. So here's my periodontist name, phone number, address, a map, whatever's on their little tear off sheet. We then go in and I type out a detailed letter that gets sent to the specialist along with my initial conversation with them long before they're ever going to see this patient. Um, and so that's a little bit of the part of this interdisciplinary collaboration that we're going to get into. Um, so let's go through and see what happens. So, so I, we do go and meet with the specialists. This is my team of specialists in Atlanta, periodontists, orthodontists, oral surgeons, endodontists. Um, they're part of our interdisciplinary team uh, because we need their input as well. And so we try not to make these kinds of decisions uh, uh, just one-sided where I make the decision and I just tell them what to do. And I also don't just throw it up in the air and say, you do what you think, and then I'll see what I get back. It's a very um, planned out and concerted effort. We'll have an actual meeting. Uh, we have scheduled meetings. So the whole group of us get together um, at least once a month and go over all the cases that we have in common. And we've got a big, huge uh, screen in the conference room at the orthodontist office that we work with. And, um, and we sit there and what I tell patients, we're gonna argue about your particular situation uh, with each other to come up with the best possible options. What is the best treatment options? And what do we do if this happens? And what do we do if that happens? And when you got the whole group together, maybe not even doctors who are gonna see this patient, so we've got one, two, three, four, five or six orthodontists in the group, a couple endodontists in the group, a couple oral surgeons in the group, uh, and a couple of periodontists in the group on this page. Uh, they aren't all seeing the patient. Maybe it's just me and one of the orthodontists and one of the periodontists. Well, great, but we're all together in the meeting. Sometimes the orthodontist and the oral surgeon are talking about a case that's not even my case, but I'm the restorative specialist in the conference, in the room every month. Usually there's only one or two of us. And so I become the expert when they have a question about some patient that's with a different doctor. And, and they'll say, oh, you know, Becker, what do you think about this, this, and this? Now I'm giving my opinion, not my patient. I haven't examined them, but they've shown me all of their records. And what's happening with all that now is this collaborative thing leads to a much more complete diagnosis. I think better treatment options and treatment planning and treatment sequencing. How, how are we gonna manage the edentulous space while the bone graft heals before we're ready for the implant to go in before we can provisionalize it or whatever. And so those kinds of conversations are all happening behind the scenes with us um, as a group. What it's turned into for me is an amazing referral source. And that's the secret that I want people to hear. Um, so if a patient comes to my orthodontist, let's say, and says, oh, I'm looking to have some work done. Uh, I don't like the way my teeth look. And the orthodontist says, well, do you have a, a restorative or a general dentist? They said, no, I don't really have anybody, um, but I knew I needed to come see you. My friend just got their teeth straightened and they look great, but they need restorative work. And, they, and so the patient says to the orthodontist, who do you think I should see? What does the orthodontist do? The orthodontist says, well, my dentist is, Dr. Becker did my veneers and the patient goes, oh, can I have their information? And so at this stage of the game, about 85% of the new patients I see are coming to me from my specialists. They're being referred to me from the specialist. Those are the best refer referrals you can possibly get. Um, and that's taken years to develop, but it's, it's worth all the extra time that I spend uh, discussing cases that aren't even mine if it, if it returns a new patient that needs my help, it's worth it. So, um, 
scheduling those meetings uh, is critical. If you don't schedule it, it doesn't happen. And so, like I said, we have those scheduled at least once a month. And, um, and usually we're conversing in between those either via text or phone or Zoom or whatever. So let's move on with this. So here is that initial uh, presentation that we saw with the uh, broken tooth, number seven. And then here it is after root canal. So, and actually what's happened here is we've had root canal, we've had a bonded post and a bonded provisional crown is what we've, we've done. And it's really just been done for one main reason, which is, so we have something to grab the root with and start to extrude it. Uh, one of the uh, problems with a broken tooth is what am I gonna attach something to if I wanna move it? Um, the other thing, by the way, so we did discuss with the periodontist because my thought was as we extrude this tooth, probably what's gonna happen, what typically happens is the bone and the gingiva come in a coronal direction as the tooth is also being extruded. So I have informed the patient that first we're gonna have to extrude the tooth. The tooth will have to be shaved down or the, the bonded provisional will have to be shaved down um, in, on the incisal edge as the tooth erupts. And as that happens, the tissue and the bone will come with it. And you're probably gonna need to have a crown lengthening procedure to get the gum back to the ideal level. It's already at, it, at the ideal level, but we're just trying to expose more tooth to attach to. Well, um, so the, the plan was with extrusion and then crown lengthening. Uh, lo and behold, as we extruded the tooth, um, and here you see that bonded provisional uh, on a post that was bonded in and a just composite, freehanded composite on tooth number eight, just to get rid of the sensitivity on that tooth and hold her through her ortho uh, extrusion. This is this picture is before extrusion. Here she is with her braces on. They've got all the uh, coils and, and bends and the wires to do what we wanted it to do. You can see how number seven now looks longer. Uh, we've been shaving it off, shaving it off, shaving it off. But interesting, the gum tissue uh, seemed to stay kind of in place. It didn't, it came down a little bit, but not as much as I thought it would. I, the, the tooth actually, you know, sort of came out. Um, I see somebody has raised their hand. If you want to put a question in the chat, that would be ideal. Um, so the, it's based on how many millimeters you want it to move. Um, and I, I typically allow the orthodontist to, to um, let's say dictate this piece. My understanding is they're moving these teeth. Um, the slower you move it, the more you're gonna get tissue and bone to come with it. The faster you move it, the less tissue and bone you're gonna have. And however long it takes to move it, we then hold it there for that same amount of time. So if this took, I'll make up a number I don't remember now, two months to get into position, we then held it there for two more months with the braces on the teeth, not moving anywhere, just holding it there. There is a formula for how long you hold it for how many millimeters you're moving it. Um, I don't keep that in my brain though. I'm sorry, if somebody has that at their hand, that would be helpful. How are you able to bond a tooth that's subgingival? Oh, great question. Yeah, so as soon as we go to decide to treat this, the first thing that happens is the, the, the crown part of the tooth comes off. So we, uh, are going to have the endo done. We're going to bond a post into the root and we're going to make a direct provisional crown bonded to that post and whatever was left of the root there. All subgingival. How is that margin? Lousy. How do I know? Because we saw it once it got extruded. It was only there as a short-term solution to give us something to hold on to with the braces to move the tooth. So that was not a definitive margin. That was not meant to be an ideal margin. There'd be no way to do that as far as I know. Um, so yeah, and yes, you could, you're right, Mario, you could do a fibrotomy and that will help to leave the, 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 the bone and tissue in its place. What's interesting, what happens is when the root broke way up at the level of the bone or above, as soon as we took the tooth out, that was the fibrotomy. 
Um, we could have gone further sub crestal with trying to um, you know, release things or whatever, but I didn't want to damage that bone. So we, we, we left everything subgingival alone attached to the post and pulled it down. How many millimeters do you do extrude the tooth? However many you need to get an enough ferrule. So uh, that was Lisa's question. Uh, we're looking to get, I would love to see, you know, four or five millimeters of ferrule. We're not gonna get that here. Uh, I think the studies show that if you've got at least two millimeters circumferentially around uh, in terms of vertical wall height uh, between the margin, the crown margin and the uh, core or buildup or post or whatever you've got coming out. Uh, so in this case, we probably needed to extrude it four or five millimeters to get there. You're gonna see here in a second, if everybody wants to see, is the post cemented permanently, even though the core is replaced later? How would you control bleeding for bonding? So Phil, great question. That's like a great question. So let me answer it this way. Um, the post cementation was not a problem because everything is internal in the tooth. We were able to manage uh, hemorrhage. There was no bleeding or anything at that point. And we could get a post cemented in place. The next step was much more tricky, which was to um, try to bond something to this tooth and so uh, to this post. So what we did was we, um, you know, we had a matrix that we made from our wax up, and we um, we we applied, we we etched, and we primed, and we bonded, and we did all of this stuff, trying to get any kind of attachment to the root and the post, and then we filled our matrix with our temporary material seeded it, let it harden completely onto that now bond coated surface and just let it harden. And the reality is, like I said, I don't know that it's a great bond and you'll see what happens in a minute here, but um, it stayed. So it totally stayed. And the mobility of the tooth, Julie, was simply just the, the, the crown piece that was loose, that was just held in by gum tissue, right? Uh, the root itself was not loose at all. It was just the crown was only being held in by soft tissue at that point. So once the crown was gone, it was fine. Um, okay. Let's look again at the x-ray. There's the initial. There's the before ortho, but here you can see how we, we this is just simply bonding in that temporary crown onto the post that's had the root canal done. Now, this is the one everybody wants to see. Drum roll, please. Oh, look in the pre-ortho picture. You see the little puff of sealant that came out at the apex? Keep an eye on that. That's gonna be our marker. And watch what happens post extrusion. I think that's so cool um, that we can see that, you said, how far do we extrude the tooth? There you go, that far. Because you can see that difference. That's how far the root moved. So now here she is after ortho extrusion, gum level is not bad on that little bonded tooth that stayed on the whole time. Um, and so we're not gonna need any crown lengthening. I will probably apply some, um, you know, I'll apply a little bit of pressure maybe with, with the shape uh, at the gingival margin. So we get a little bit of um, apical migration of the tissue there. But we don't need much. It's, it's almost perfect where the tissue level is on that number seven. Now, at this point, also, she says, you know, I've always hated my lateral incisors. They're always so small. Could we make them both bigger? Well, sure. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, so here she is with her temporary crown um, bonded to the post and her composite freehand, composite on number eight to uh, resolve that issue. Um, interesting on this picture, you can actually see, I'm pointing like you can see where my finger is. Uh, you can see the, um, where the enamel is starting to show up out of the tissue. See the margin between the, the provisional and the, and, the, um, and the tooth. So we, we've really pulled that, that guy out of the gum pretty well. And um, we ended up with a nice ferrule. So, but now, as I said, she's decided, can we make my laterals bigger? Okay, sure. So a little bit of a shift in the treatment plan 
we and by and this actually happened before ortho because we actually opened space as you can see and we're going to veneer number 10 to match so at this point she's going to have a restoration on seven eight and ten and i said you don't have to but if you want it to look you know more perfect if you want to call it that you're probably going to want a veneer nine as well uh, she didn't need it done but that was um, that was her choice to do that. So we ended up doing seven through ten, um, and we also did composite on that uh, twelve and thirteen where it fractured, but that's not in here. So we do a little bit of uh, playing around in Keynote or or, or PowerPoint and just kind of see what it's going to look like if we modify the shapes of those teeth, and um, and that's you know that's kind of what we get. Now, the next step is going to be her, her new wax up, which we do uh, after ortho wax up with the new design. And we're going to uh, provisionalize the, the planned restoration, seven through 10. Uh, seven is gonna be a full crown. Eight is gonna be a crown ear. Uh, nine is gonna be a veneer. 10 is gonna be a veneer. Um, and I'm gonna share with you a mistake I made. Uh, Lisa says, temporary looks great. Mario says, I wanna do some extrusion of that central that was chipped when I spoke to the orthodontist. He felt it was not stable situation. Patient had a class one occlusion. Okay. Okay. How do you stabilize the extrusion of seven? Well, like I said, we're gonna hold it in place um, for, this, for the same duration of however long it took to move it there. And that seems to do the trick. She's also going to end up in a splint, uh, a, a hard acrylic uh, flat plane splint for protection um, that she'll wear at night that will act as a retainer as well. Uh, okay, so moving on. So these are the provisionals. How are the veneers held in place? You mean the provisional veneers? So we're going to hold the provisional blah, 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 blah. we're going to hold the provisional veneers in place uh, with a uh, spot bond shrink wrap technique um, that we utilize that seems to work really well. We also keep the the three veneers splinted together as as one unit that tends to help them stay on as well. Um, we give the patient a suck down Essex trutane type of a retainer that if they did come off she could simply put them in her retainer and wear that until we could get her back. But they seem to stay on pretty well. Can we see the veneer prep, please? It's not in the presentation because I'm going to run out of time anyway. Um, I, I couldn't show everything. But it's just a traditional veneer prep on, on uh, 9 and 10. 8 was a sort of modified, I call it a crown ear prep because half the tooth was already gone anyway. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what that was. Uh, okay. Moving on, these are the provisionals. Let's move on. Here's a close up of those provisionals. And I think that the tissue response is nice. I think that the shape is nice, you know, making those, um, making those laterals a little bit bigger, I think made a difference. Uh, her lip is crooked because of her injury, but the, you know, I think it makes it look natural and the teeth look good. Um, and now here's the finals. Now I gotta tell you the secret here, and this is where I messed up. These are her final restorations, crown on seven, veneer on eight, nine, and 10. The, the, this picture is about a year and a half after we had placed these restorations. She was back at school. I never got to do the final pictures. So she came in um, for me to get the pictures and it was already a while now. And look at number seven. See how it's kind of graying out? What was my mistake was that I simply prepared through that provisional that we had made originally that was used to pull the tooth down in ortho. I didn't remove all of it and do a separate buildup. I, I went ahead and I just prepared what was there, not thinking as everybody pointed out that in fact, that bond was horrible. So obviously it, it darkened, it, it stained. So I ended up having to cut that crown off, take away all of the 
core material, which was like I say, the original provisional and rebuild a core and have a new crown made. Lesson learned. You all are smarter than me and you wouldn't have done that because you already said that, but I, I missed that. I, I was thinking that I could just use what was there as, as the, um, as the buildup, but she, she was totally understanding of it. She, she's like the greatest patient in the world. Uh, you know, now she's 20, 21 at this point, here's a close up. Um, I got to give props to the lab. This is Matt Roberts work in, in Idaho, um, CMR dental lab. And, um, and he, I always say he doesn't make veneers. He makes teeth. They just, to me, look like her teeth could be. Uh, these are Emacs restorations. They are monolithic. He typically does some bit of uh, cutback in the design. Not He doesn't grind on the Emacs. He cuts it back in the design. And, um, and then he layers some effects on just the facial incisal third. And that incisal edge is part of the monolithic material. It's not layered material. So all the cutback is, is on non-functional surface. Uh, but we're doing some of these now with the new multi-layer uh, blocks that are no, no layering at all. It's 100% uh, monolithic with um, internal uh, staining that they do before they sinter it, before they bake it. And it really looks great. Um, Julie says, great job. Thank you. What core material bond did you use to redo seven? Uh, so I'm pretty sure it would have been, well, what was the core material we were using? Um, it, it probably was just core paste, uh, by, um, I think that's Bisco and, uh, the adhesive we use is, um, uh, uh OptiBond FL, uh, it, it's, it's the old, like, three multi-bottle etch prime adhesive multi-step. I'm still old school with that. I, I do not use a one bottle system. Um, that, that's, a, that's maybe a flaw in, my, in myself, but um, I don't have any problems. So that's why I keep using it. Uh, okay, so here she is. Um, cute, right? Looks great. Just that gray tooth, which drives me nuts. We're gonna get new pictures of her now that we redid it. But uh, isn't it hard to remove an Hemax crown? Yes, I removed two of them today. My hand still hurts. They're hard. Um, soft touch. You don't want to bear down on them. Uh, I, we use a, a, a kind of medium to fine grit diamond, real slow, lots of water, so it doesn't generate too much heat or sparks. <laughs> it does spark sometimes. And you just go real slow and you go through a bunch of burrs. Not, but I will tell you this, cutting off an Emax is easy compared to cutting off zirconia. So I'd rather cut off Emacs any day of the week. Uh, the only dilemma with it is it really does bond well to enamel. Uh, so if you're cutting one off of enamel, you really kind of end up having to grind the whole thing off. It's not one that you're gonna probably make a slice through it and take an instrument and pry it apart. Uh, it, it, they, it bonds too well. Uh, whereas zirconia, once you finally cut through it, it usually just pops right off because it doesn't bond that well. Anyway. Uh, but yes, that's, that is true. So, okay. So that's an example of what, what might initially look like just an aesthetic case, but it had a whole lot more complications that I couldn't have managed without the help of my endodontist, my orthodontist, and potentially my periodontist who ended up not needing to step in, but was part of the decision-making. Okay. Let's move on to another, another case. Um, and, and this is a more recent case. This, this is, we just finished this case. Um, and she came to me first, the first thing she says is, um, uh, I know you're going to tell me my mouth is, is falling apart, but I don't want to do anything. Okay. I said, would it be okay if I at least show you what, what we see so that you can be as well informed as possible? So we did our comprehensive exam that we teach at, at Panky. Uh, that I learned way back when and um, went through and demonstrated to her everything that we noticed in her mouth. Now, during that awakening for her, as she was learning about her, her mouth, um, she then says, you know, I've always hated the, the way my front teeth look 
that that they're they're sort of worn and they're short in the front and and they have discoloration where there's some old bonding or something so all of a sudden you know she came in i don't want anything and now she's asking me how can we fix my teeth um so i didn't have to sell her anything but what i did have to do is inform her that there's a reason why her teeth are worn the way they are so she has a very um uneven unlevel lower occlusal plane she has a reverse smile line with the incisal edge of her front teeth. She has a lot of wear and chipping on her on her upper front teeth without the benefit of uh, compensatory eruption. So a lot of times when we see wear, the tooth will wear, but it'll it'll keep erupting down. Um, and so the incisal edge kind of stays in the same place. She's having that, but it's a little different here. I'm going to show you why. So this is her sort of lips at rest. Here she is um, biting down. She is end to end on that upper left side uh, from, from basically the mesial of eight, all of nine, all of 10 is end to end with the lower, almost in crossbite. So she says to me, well, can't we make my teeth longer? I have this discolored bonding here. They've tried to bond it before and it, I don't think they're doing a good job because it doesn't stay. And I said, well, yeah, it's discolored, but what's the problem here is not that their bonding isn't any good. It's that there's nowhere for you to put the bonding. Because if we build this tooth to an ideal size, it'll be the only thing that touches in the front of your teeth. Your back teeth won't touch at all. She said, yeah, every time they do it, it, it feels like it hits heavy and then it doesn't last. I said, right. So I said to her, um, if you want to try to improve the appearance of these teeth, we've got a couple of options. Um, and the first one would be to correct the tooth position so that we have room to restore the teeth. She said, what does that mean? I said, well, that, that, that would be an orthodontic procedure to, to move your teeth. You mean it like braces on my teeth? I said, well, it might be braces. It might be something like Invisalign uh, or you know, some sort of clear aligner therapy. But yeah. Uh, that would be an ideal way to manage this. And then we could really get the teeth how you want them to look. She said, what's the other option? I said, well, the other option is we could uh, prepare these teeth and create um, a, a restoration that would um, make the tooth look better, fix the color match issue. And we could make the teeth sort of fatter, like stick them out so that we would have a little bit of room to make them a little longer. But I said, I don't know how long that would hold up, how well that would do. Um, and it would really not be my first choice. And she said, well, I really don't think I want to have orthodontics at this stage of my life. I said, I understand. Um, let's, let's do this. Let me, let me mock up a model and, and just see what it would look like if we did this without ortho. So I did. I waxed the case up and I, I showed her and it really wasn't that much of an improvement. It was a little bit better. And I said, I don't know how long this is going to hold up like this because you, you still don't have anywhere to function. And this was the kicker. I said, to do this, I have to drill away. I have to drill away an additional, you know, several millimeters of your enamel to make this work. So we have enough thickness of porcelain to, to be strong enough. I said, now we're looking at a tooth that's already had four or five millimeters worth of enamel worn off of it by you. Now I'm going to take another two millimeters off or a millimeter and a half, whatever it is. And I said, that's not the best idea. So after maybe a couple of conversations, showing her this and talking about how her bite was, she um, finally gets it. And she's decided she wants her teeth to look better. We've shown her some pictures of some other cases we've done. And she says, all right, well, I get it. This isn't going to work. And I mean, I showed her all these pictures. And I said, so, so we've got it, we got to fix this. Now we come into the same, the same scenario. Uh, and this one is a lot simpler, but I want to use this time to talk about why I think this is so important to, to have a collaborative um, relationship with your specialists. I can't work without them. Um, I think we get more predictability with these complex cases. A case like hers, if I try to just do it on my own, I, I, I don't know what the long-term prognosis would be of doing that. Um, 
I think we get a more complete and comprehensive treatment plan and diagnosis because it's a whole bunch of us putting our heads together. It, it's that, it's that uh, uh, the sum of the, wait, the, the group is greater than the sum of the parts. And, and we really do come up with, um, with ideas and thoughts that none of us would have come up with on our own necessarily. Um, it helps build confidence with the patient. It's unbelievable when you tell a patient today, especially, all right, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to go have a conversation with the orthodontist and we're going to talk about you behind your back. And we're going to argue to come up with the best possible diagnosis and treatment options for you. And they're like, wait, you're going to talk to another doctor. None of my doctors talk to each other. And we know that's true. Cause if you try to talk to any of our uh, medical brethren and my apologies to any of them that might be on here, uh, that's tough. But Dennis, we seem to be able to talk to each other somehow. And, um, and particularly when we're looking at it in this sort of collaborative way, not, not in a dictative way. Um, and it really is a great referral source. Like I said, 85% of my new patients are, um, are coming to me from referrals directly from my specialists. I think it's more profitable, profitable. And I know we don't love to talk about that necessarily, but why is it more profitable? Well, I think because we're getting these more complete plans that are including everything. And it's, it's not the hodgepodge, we'll do a little bit of this and we'll do a little bit of that. It's a much more comprehensive approach, which I think is more profitable. Uh, I think it's more fun. The most fun I have besides doing this is, um, is when we have our, our, our meetings with our specialists and, um, and we get to talk about all these cases. I always look back and, and I remember in dental school, um, and most of us have these, at least it, I have mixed emotions about dental school, um, but the good parts that I remember are when we would sit around, once we were seeing patients, and it was the blind leading the blind for sure, but we would be in the student lounge and there'd be four or five or six of us sitting around with our charts and our models and our x-rays and whatever, because we didn't know what the hell we were doing anyway. And we were like, well, what, what do you think? I don't know, what do you think? And we would just throw things out. It was so much fun. Well, now I'm doing it with people who are really intelligent, who've got a lot of experience. Now I have a lot of experience and now it's really fun. Um, and these are, these are um, great meetings. And it's my, it's my favorite thing I do in dentistry right now is our, our specialist meetings. Um, and so real quick, I mean, the, it's the difference between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. Interdisciplinary being... Um, this collaborative idea where we're, we're working together with a common goal and the left hand knows what the right hand is doing versus multidisciplinary, which I would argue is the more common thing that happens today, which is uh, uh, we need an we need a ortho consult. Uh, here's a orthodontist or here's a several orthodontists, pick one. I don't do that. I pick the one I want them to work with that I think is going to do the best job for us. And I tell them that this is who I need you to see because it has to be somebody who's willing to do this with me. Uh, and then the multidisciplinary, like I say, is just, it's you do ortho, you do endo, you do perio, and then we'll see what happens. Um, so how do I choose my team? That's a big one. And I feel for those of you who live in a place that doesn't have access to a great specialist. Fortunately for me, uh, I don't have that problem. Um, so I think we have to have similar treatment philosophies. If you have somebody whose main thing is, um, you know, I only do uh, all on fours or whatever, that's great if you have an all on four case, but if you have a case that that's not what it needs, that's problematic. That's not gonna be the person you wanna to refer to. Uh, if you believe in conservative dentistry and uh, uh, somebody else is more aggressive, or if you love implants and they don't or whatever, that doesn't work. You have to have similar treatment philosophies. I think you have to have similar practice philosophies. It's really confusing to patients if they walk into one office that is a, um, a comprehensive fee-for-service um, relationship-based type practice, uh, and then you get referred to a practice that maybe is um, a, a much busier practice with way more going on and in insurance plans and um, and, and they're more doing fix on failure dentistry or something uh, that gets really confusing to patients. 
you know, if you start talking to a patient about like this patient we just showed you, we're going to do ortho and we're going to correct the bite. And remember, the ortho is not to line the incisal edges. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, it's a prescribed ortho that's with the plan of our final restorations in mind. Um, you know, that that's the difference. That's the real difference. And then if you send that patient to an orthodontist that doesn't understand or do that, they're going to get there and the orthodontist can say, no, 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 we just line up your incisal edges and get everything hitting right and it'll be fine. Great. Now I've got to drill away more tooth again. If you all are similar thinkers, why would you argue a case? Ha ha. Phil, that's funny. Thank you for that. Uh, we, we, are, we are very similar in terms of our practice philosophies and our treatment philosophies, but we all are individual thinkers. And so we do think of things differently. And remember, I said there's oral surgeons in the group. So no offense to the oral surgeons out there, but they're usually very, um, oh, um, um, what's the right word? I was going to say opinionated, but um, they're, they're pretty, pretty proud and they pretty much know everything that they need to know. Uh, and I'm generalizing, that's not all of them, but uh, yeah, we argue, but it's fun arguing. Uh, you got to be willing to document cases. Uh, here's a big deal, because if you're working with a periodontist who doesn't document, don't, doesn't take pictures of their cases, doesn't really document it well, maybe a great surgeon, but if you're going to sit in a meeting and talk about a case and they can't show their stuff to, to be a part of the conversation, that's really tough. So everybody's got to be willing to document cases, got to be willing to, to, to hear and share new ideas. Um, you know, uh, several years ago when we started paying more attention to airway, we always paid a little attention, especially with ortho. But now I think we're all we've had an awakening. And um, and not everybody had gotten the message up front, but everybody was willing to listen and go to take a course and um, and, and, and invest the time to learn more so that we're all we're all continuing to learn and, and, and share new things. Um, and they got to be willing to invest time. This is not easier. This is not quicker. This takes more time and it's by far more challenging and difficult. Um, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time doing this, but I really think it, it, it's worthwhile. And I know, I know it pays off in the end. So at Panky, we used to teach something called statements of collaboration. It's an agreement you know, between the, the different groups, the different specialists and the restorative dentists. Um, that was difficult for people, uh, but I look at it a little differently. Maybe we need to talk about how are we going to refer our patients? So we have to decide that and agree that this is, this is how our referral is going to go. Um, are you going to send me a paper copy? Uh, we're going to send all of our photos. We're going to send all of our x-rays today with digital models. We send the models. Um, you know, how is the referral going to go? How are we going to communicate? Are we going to have a, a meeting? Are we going to do it on Zoom? Are we going to go to your office or my office? Um, what's the system in place? What is the um, occlusal and treatment philosophy? What, what, what are we going to agree to that this is how we like to leave our cases with uh, you know, anterior coupling, with occlusion the way we want it, with good uh, uh, anterior guidance, with good crossover, all of these things. Um, and what other agreements do we need to talk about? So that's, it doesn't, we have not formalized that the way it, we used to teach it. I don't know that we still teach it that way, but we still have that in place and then having our meetings. So let's get back to our case. Um, this is how she ends up post-ortho. Notice her back teeth are in occlusion. She has now had her upper teeth um, flared. Her lower occlusal plane has been leveled. Remember it was all crooked. Uh, and we have plenty of room now. So they've created overjet before she was end to end. Now she has appropriate overjet. And by intruding the teeth, guess what I don't have to do? I don't have to drill away hardly any enamel, especially on number nine and 10. Uh, and to me, that is as huge of a benefit as almost anything we're talking about. Um, and all of the margins uh, at the gum line will be on enamel, which if we're talking about bonding a veneer, that's what you want. If, if the orthodontist had leveled the incisal edges, um, 
we would have had to drill away a lot more tooth structure and we would be dealing with possibly having margins up on, um, on, on dentin, on root surface. Uh, okay. So that's the before and the end. That's the after with plenty of overjet. Let's move past these. And so here she is in her provisionals. So after ortho, we get records. We send it to our lab. Our lab does a diagnostic. And we, I should say, everything we do is digital. Um, Itero is the scanner I use. There are great scanners out there. They all work. Um, they all produce a file called an STL file. And that can be used in almost any design software. Our lab uses um, uh, uses three shape uh, design software, the, the lab version of that. And so they can take our scans and, and design this. They can then send me the, the digital file of the design. I can print a model on my 3D printer and then I can make a matrix and we can have these provisionals um, fabricated right in the mouth. This case is treated in centric relation. Um, and ortho can be done in centric relation and should be done in centric relation. If you finish ortho with the condyles not in a seated and braced position, and then the condyle seats, you'll have an anterior open bite. So we definitely want to make sure that the condyle is seated uh, when we finish ortho, for sure. Okay, so we can see the provisionals. What of course happens is she decides that she doesn't like the look of more and more teeth. So it ends up being a 10 tooth case. What I thought was gonna maybe be a six or an eight tooth case. She wanted more teeth done um, and that happens. So she's in her provisionals and, um, and you know we're testing them out. We're gonna leave these provisionals in for as long as we need to, to feel like A, she likes the look and the feel and the function and B, to make sure that it is holding up and that, and that, that the porcelain, I mean, the um, plastic's not chipping, the provisional. This is, um, this is Luxacrown um, material that I have found to really love. It's, it's, a, um, it's a bisacryl that I think has some composite stuff in it. And it really is nice. Um, Luxacrown, I don't know who makes that, but anyway. Uh, yeah, so there she is in her provisionals. Here she is in her finals. So nice, right? She really opened up. Her smile got, got pretty and she got a little bit more personality than you saw in the first thing. Every picture I took of her before we got to the finals, her eyes were up to the right. I don't know if anybody noticed that. Every single picture no matter what I did. And then as soon as we got these on, her eyes came right to the camera. It was really cool. Um, so we can see them close up. Again, these are Emacs restorations, um, monolithic multi-layered multi, multi um, layered Emacs, multi, what they call it, multi-block. And, um, and these are bonded in with, uh, with Verilink, um, uh, Ivoclar, Verilink. And we use the Varial link adhesive for these. So some observation, thank you, Stephen. I do think they're beautiful too. And she loves them. I thought she was gonna be a tough cookie, but once we got to the provisionals and she loved those, I knew we were in, we were in it to win it. So um, have regular scheduled meetings with your specialists. Have and share good documentation. Take CE together, go to study clubs together. Um, we're having tomorrow, we're actually having a team building um, event with all of the, with a lot of the offices that we work with, with the teams. My, my uh, hygienist comes with me to our meetings to help me because I can't multitask and talk and write at the same time. And then my front desk is always talking with the, with the other offices. We help uh, schedule patients, you know, we help coordinate their treatment. <clears throat> if you're into teaching, teach together. I love when I get to teach with my orthodontist or with my periodontist. It's so fun. Socialize, fish, golf, ski, travel, whatever you do. These people can become your, your, your long-term friends. My dad's periodontist, shout out to my dad. Woo -woo. Um, 
his periodontist that he worked with his whole career is my godfather, Steve Chase. And um, uh, I mean, that's how close we were with them. Uh, I just went fishing with my endodontist last weekend. We had a great time. So um, I'm gonna leave you with this. These are my two of my kids, uh, two of my nieces and my sister. And uh, my sister's pretty spiritual and she uh, believes in living in the moment. And uh, so I encourage you all to do that.